So thank you, Philip, and I hope you like enjoy this in the book. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Philip Stutz, and I'm a PhD student at the University of Zurich. And we've been working for almost three years now on a programming model and framework called Signal Collect. And I'm going to tell you today how you can use that to process very large graphs in mere seconds. First, I'm going to motivate why we need it and what the basic ideas are behind the framework and programming model. And then I walk you through uh, an example and a live demo with that example. Uh, afterwards, I'm going to tell you about some special features of the programming model like asynchronous executions. I'm going to show you some benchmark results of the framework and hopefully at the end there's some time left for questions. So uh, what is signal collect? You can think of it uh, as sort of a map reduce for graphs in the sense of that it allows you to run algorithms on large graphs massively parallelized. Uh, the programming model that is probably most closely related to signal collect is uh, Google's Pregel. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with that. But in Signal Collect, it's, uh, one of the main ideas is that it's very modular. So you can think of vertices and edges as modular building blocks that you can plug together. So one of the main features is that you can have different vertices and edge types in the same compute graphs. Uh, let me make that a bit more concrete. So uh, in Signal Collect, you can think of the vertices as uh, stateful actors. And uh, these actors uh, interact along the edges with uh, signals that are sent along the edges to other vertices. On these other vertices, these signals are collected into a new vertex state. I'm going to give you a concrete example with a, a simplified page rank algorithm. So in this graph here, we have no cycles, so we can use a simplified version of page rank. Many of you probably know uh, page rank. It's, uh, the algorithm that allowed Google, uh, when they started out, uh, to have better rankings than most of their competitors. And uh, the basic idea behind the page rank algorithm is that a vertex in the, in the graph has a higher rank if uh, other vertices with high ranks link to it. And that uh, a vertex sort of splits up its rank among all the vertices to which it has out edges. And uh, in signal collect, uh, the building blocks to capture such an algorithm is one has to define a signal function on the edges and a collect function on the vertices. The signal function calculates the signal that is sent along the edge based on the state of the vertex to which it is attached. And in the page ra simplified page rank example, that's just uh, the state of the vertex itself. In this case, uh, we initialize all the vertices with a state of 10. So that's 10 divided by the uh, out edge count. So for the vertex uh, here, because it has two out edges, we split up the rank between the two edges. For the vertices that on, for the edges that are attached to a vertex that has only one edge, they send the whole rank along that edge. Now these signal are signals are sent along the edges, and uh, the vertex that receives the signal uh, uses the collect function to compute its new state. In this case, uh, the collect function is uh, 10 plus the sum of all the signals that we receive by the vertex. So in the case of this vertex here, it's 10 plus 15, so the new state is 25. And uh, this algorithm is executed iteratively in the programming model. So there's a, steps, a step where all the vertices signal, and then there's a step where all the vertices collect. And uh, the standard heuristic is that a signal is only sent and computed if the state has changed during the last step. So because this vertex hasn't updated its state, it's not going to send uh, a signal in the next step. But uh, this vertex has changed the state to from 10 to 15. So it's going to send another th signal of 15. And you can see how this iteratively computes a simplified page rank on the graph. <coughs> now, I would like to uh, show you how easy it is to take these ideas and implement them on a real world use case. So uh, the idea here is that we would like to uh, rank uh, publications. And uh, a way one could uh, use this to uh, rank publications would be to map each publication to a vertex in the graph and to map each citation between uh, publications to an edge between those uh, vertices. And uh, just like uh, it allowed Google to rank websites on the internet according to their uh, importance in the graph structure, this would allow us to uh, rank publications based on their importance in the citation structure. And uh, 
now it's uh, demo time, so I'm going to show you how you can use Signal Collect to actually implement this on a real-world data set. And uh, our goal is to uh, take a real-world data set, map it into a Signal Collect graph, and then run the citation ranking on it. And uh, the data set that we're going to use for this is uh, from DBLP, and it contains about 100,000 citations and 25,000 uh, IDs of publications. That's like only four citations per paper on average, so maybe there's some uh, publications that have uh, several uh, IDs in that graph. So I don't know about the data quality, so take the results with a grain of salt. And uh, the data set is stored in a file where each line in the file represents a citation, where uh, the first uh, part of the line indicates the URL of the first publication, then we have a cites URL, and then a publication URL of the publication that's being cited by the first one. And this is a linked open data, which means that we can take these URLs, put them in a web browser, and uh, we get more uh, information about the publication behind that URL. So let me get started. This is a text file where you can see these URLs. So this would be the URL of the citing publication. This is the references relationship. And this is the real URL of the publication that's being cited. And you can see uh, Gandhari Zade 93 and Gandhari Zade 90. So this is probably a self-citation even. <laughs> now, uh, in order to save some time, I uh, already added a parser down here. And what this parser essentially does, it, uh, uh, we pass it a file name and a handler that does something with the first string and the third string in a line. And uh, we can do something with this. So this is going to save some time. Uh, the editor you see here is uh, uh, Eclipse with the Scala plugin. And uh, this is the standard entry point of a Scala application, the uh, object example. So if I start adding code here, that's being executed when I execute this class. So in order to... Uh, specify the computation on these publications, we're going to need uh, a vertex that represents a publication. So uh, let's call this class publication. And uh, the way to do this in uh, single collect is by extending one of the standard vertex implementation. And the vertex that behaves like the one that I showed you at the beginning is the data graph uh, vertex. And uh, we also need to uh, Pass this publication, we have to give it an ID, which is a string. This is going to be the URL that you've seen in the text file before, and an initial, an initial state for the page rank computation. This is a double, uh, and we initialize it to 10 if we don't specify anything else. And we pass these constructor parameters on to the data graph vertex. So that's the first step. And as I told you, uh, a vertex needs to uh, have a collect function that uh, tells the vertex how it can update its state based on the signals it has received. So for this publication, we define this function. And uh, as we had it before, it's going to be the initial state, the 10 we have up there, plus uh, the sum of the signals. Now, because single clock is very modular, uh, this vertex could receive signals of any type. So this is, but this is not a complex graph. So in this case, we're going to help the framework, and we're going to tell it that the type of the signals is al always going to be uh, a double, because that's the type of the signals that get sent around. And uh, Scala allows us then to invoke the sum function on the collection when it knows that it's uh, a numeric, uh, that the, the collection contains items of type numeric. And uh, this way, we have to find the collect function. Now, we also need a, a way to map citations to uh, parts of a, compute of, of a single collect graph. And uh, the way we're going to do that is uh, we create the class citation. And uh, this extends the default edge. This is the, one of the easier ways of creating an edge in single collect. And uh, a citation always gets attached to the source vertex. So we don't need the ID of the source vertex, but we need the ID of the target vertex. Uh, the ID of the vertex that this, uh, ed this citation is going to. So this is the, the ID of the publication that's being cited. And it's a string again. And uh, 
uh, an etch and signal collect needs a signal function that computes how the signal that is sent along this etch is computed. In this case, uh, the signal function takes the state of the source vertex and divides it by the number of outgoing etches, as we've seen in the algorithm before. And uh, we can access the source vertex with a source and a source state. Now the problem is this edge could be attached to any kind of vertex because single collect is modular. But in this case, it's only ever going to be attached to a publication. So we can simplify uh, the matters by not having to match the state and see what kind of a type it is. We can just say type of source equals uh, publication to tell signal collect that this uh, edge is only ever going to be attached to a publication vertex. And now we still need to divide the source state by the number of outgoing edges, which we do by source dot outgoing edges dot size. This gives us the number of outgoing edges of our source vertex. And uh, this is the mapping of uh, the data set to the single collect compute graph now. What we need to do is still uh, create that compute graph. The way to build a compute graph in single collect is uh, uh, using a graph builder. And this would give us lots of uh, different configuration options. We could specify what kind of uh, uh, messaging we use, what kind of worker implementation. So it's a very modular system. But in this case, we're just going to use the default implementation. Um, now we're going to use the, the parser to add all these citations from the data set you've just seen to this compute graph. Uh, the file name is uh, citations.nt. And the handler, we're just going to define that one. We don't have it yet. Let's just call it uh, process citation. Now we're implementing this process citation function. Process citation takes uh, two uh, strings, the citer and uh, the cited. So this process citation function is going to be called by the parser with the citer and the cited string. And uh, every time we get called, we're going to add a vertex to the graph for the for the citing publication and one vertex for the cited publication. We're going to instantiate the publication class that we just defined up here for the vertex. And we do the same thing for the cited publication. And then we add a citation edge between them. So for every citation, this adds two vertices for the two publications that are, that are citing each other and an edge between them. So you're going to notice that this is going to add uh, each vertex multiple times if it appears in multiple citations. But this is not a problem because uh, if there's an ID collision, signal collect will just ignore any further vertex addition. So it would only add it, the vertex the first time around, we call it. So what's left to do is we have to execute the computation. Uh, we have different execution parameters, but we're just going to use the default ones in this case. And uh, at the end, we have to shut down the graph. But in this case, we wouldn't know about the results. So we also have to find out what the, the best site or the most important site publications are in this data set. And for that, we're going to use an uh, aggregation operation over the, over the graph. And there's already some predefined uh, aggregation operations. So in this case, we're going to use uh, uh, top k finder, which uh, on the doubles of the state. So this uh, top k finder is going to find for us the, the top 10 publications that have the highest uh, page ranks in this graph. And we assign them to uh, a variable called top 10. Now, uh, we of course also want to print those top 10, so we print them. Like that. OK, so what we're doing here is we're creating the graph first. Then we call the parser to add the vertices to the graph. We execute the computation. We run an aggregation over the graph to find the top 10 uh, publications. We print them, and then we end the graph. Let's execute that. OK, it's 
running now. And we have the results already. So this URL here is for the publication with the highest rank. You see the COD 70. This is the URL to the left. And to the right, you see the rank it has. It's 2,526. So an ordinary publication just got the initial 10 if it didn't get cited. And COD had uh, 250 times more than that. Now, uh, let's see what kind of a publication that is. Because this is linked open data, we can just add it to a web browser. And we see that uh, it's a, a relational model of data for large shared data banks. So IBM Research in the 70s. That's pretty important, the beginning of relational databases. And uh, if you look, you also see that Knut makes an appearance here, or Stonebreaker. So we really seem to have found some of the more important publications using this algorithm. OK, so result number one, caught. Then uh, next one would have been caught, caught too, but that's a bit boring. So uh, we, I took the next one again. This is the entity relationship model. And the third one is IBM again, uh, system R, one of the first SQL implementations. So I think this was pretty interesting to see how uh, we could take this citation data set and within just a few minutes uh, I'll apply an algorithm to it and find some interesting results that weren't obvious when we just looked at the data. I hope I convinced you uh, with this that uh, with Signal Collect you can take uh, a data set and uh, build an algorithm with just a few, within just a few seconds. And uh, this doesn't just apply for uh, PageRank, but uh, Signal Collect allows you to build elegant solutions for many different uh, problems, like uh, computing graph measures, shortest paths, or uh, uh, clustering coefficients. It also allows you to solve uh, constraint optimization problems like uh, vertex coloring. We have clustering algorithms or relational classifiers. So there's many, many algorithms that have a very natural uh, mapping to single collect to this programming model. And uh, one of the th special things about single collect is that it also allows you to run algorithms asynchronously. To give you an example of why this might be helpful, I'm going to introduce a vertex coloring problem to you. So we have two vertices here. And uh, the goal of this algorithm is to have uh, them both have different colors. Now we, we run this algorithm the way we ran the algorithm at the beginning, you know, computation step. First every vertex signals, then every vertex uh, collects. It's going to happen like this. Each vertex is going to signal its state. So it's a very simple single function. And the collect function is going to be choose a free color. Now this is not a very good vertex coloring algorithm, but in this case it, uh, it's uh, very easy and it shows the point. So each vertex signals its, uh, its own color in a first step. And then the collect function tells it to choose a free color. Now this yellow vertex sees yellow is already taken. And this guy sees that yellow is already taken as well. So they both switch to blue. Now the signal function tells them to signal their state again. So the blue, they each tell each other that uh, they're blue now. And the collect function tells them choose a free color. Yellow is free now. So they both switch to yellow. And send each other a yellow message again. You see how this is never going to converge. This is just going to keep oscillating between blue and uh, yellow. And that is one of the that one problem that many algorithms have uh, when you execute them synchronously. Now, uh, what signal collect allows you to do is to really treat the vertices more like actors, where every vertex just collects and signals at will. And uh, for many algorithms, this will still lead to a correct result, but uh, it allows you to use some optimizations when it comes to implementing the, the algorithm, to running the algorithm, and very often will converge better. So, to give you an example, how this could work out. This vertex starts first, and it signals yellow to the other vertex. This vertex uh, collects it, changes its color to blue, signals black blue. And this vertex collects it, and is already happy with yellow because the other vertex is blue, so yellow is fine. So it has already converged if you run it asynchronously. Uh, we've run uh, this as an experiment with some uh, slightly more elaborate uh, vertex coloring uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, and we. Uh, ran it on a 100 by 100 Latin square. So a 100 by 100 Latin square is essentially a grid where each vertex in a row is uh, connected and each vertex in a column is connected. So it's quite dense. And we ran vertex coloring there with different numbers of colors. Uh, vertex coloring is of course harder when you have fewer colors. So it's easy here and it gets progressively harder as you move here. And uh, you see the red line is the execution time for the synchronous version and the blue one is the execution time for the asynchronous version. And uh, the asynchronous version still converges for problems where the synchronous version doesn't even converge anymore within a reasonable amount of time. 
So uh, this is one of the advantages of uh, being able to execute algorithms asynchronously. Now, uh, single collect has many other features. For example, uh, we already used automated convergence detection for the PageRank algorithm. So uh, the standard heuristic is that if the state doesn't change, you don't need to tell your neighbors that your state has changed. And uh, that can lead to automated convergence detection for many algorithms. If that heuristic isn't right, you can just plug in your own heuristic for uh, convergence detection. Other things you can do is you can modify the graph during a computation. So even a vertex can add other vertexes, for example, which allows you to create whole new algorithms. Then one thing that I'm particularly excited about is the ability to have different vertex and edge types in the same graph. If you think about it, you could have one algorithm on one side computing something and another algorithm on the other side in the same graph computing something. Then it gets really interesting if you have sort of a pipeline and this algorithm impl influences the other one while they're running. But you could also have two algorithms that influence each other while they're running. So it really is a modular system where you can build some pretty cool stuff. And uh, another feature is a uh, MapReduce style aggregation over vertices, which we've already used in a special implementation for the top K finder that you saw. But you can do many other kinds of aggregations. You can even do a uh, convergence detection based on such a global value. But now, building, fast, building algorithms is cool, and if it's easy, that's nice. But what you really want when you're processing large graphs is scalability, right? And uh, what signal collect does, it takes all these uh, functions you have, these signal collect functions, and it transparently parallelizes them. For example, if you have a, a machine with many cores, uh, you can run it on multiple threads. So here we ran uh, PageRank on a web graph data set with almost a million vertices and five million edges between them. And here you see the computation time with different numbers of threads. This was a machine with 24 cores. And you see if you run it with one core, it takes really long to execute. And we run it with uh, 24 cores, it's a lot faster. And you also see that the asynchronous version performed even for PageRank, always slightly better than a synchronous version. Uh, but when it gets really exciting is even larger graphs, when you have a cluster and you want to run your algorithm on a cluster. So what we've done is we've taken the uh, AltaVista web uh, graph data set, which is huge. It has, uh, it has more than 1.4 billion vertices and more than 6.6 .6 billion edges. So it is a humongous graph. And uh, we ran that on just 12 machines, or from 4 to 12 machines. And you see, as we're using more machines, the execution time goes down. And at 12 machines, we managed to process this huge graph in just 137 seconds as the fastest time. And we were able to load in 45 seconds. So signal collect really allows you to uh, scale on a machine or massively on a cluster. Also, the scalability curve doesn't seem to go down yet. So I'm quite confident that we could scale to much larger clusters. Then. Yes, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, hopefully I've got you interested enough to uh, wonder how can you try it out. And uh, Single Collect is Apache 2 licensed, which means you can do with it whatever you want. It's even for commercial purposes. You find the source code on uh, GitHub, and uh, contributors are welcome. The source code base is still quite small and is quite modular, so you can plug in different schedulers, you can plug in different implementations for most components of the system. So it's very hackable. Overall, it's still less than 10,000 lines of code. Or you can also download the release at www.signalcollect.com, where you have a, a nice getting started guide that sets you up with an IDE and gets you running on an example algorithm within minutes. So I hope I got you interested in uh, trying Signal Collect, and uh, thank you very much for your attention. There's still some time for questions. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah. We, have time. yeah we still have uh, six minutes, so if you have any questions, uh, feel free to ask. Yeah. I have two questions, at least. Thank you. It was very nice. Thank you very much. My first question is, is in your asynchronous version of the algorithm, how do you determine the, the order of the signaling of the node? Who first and who In asynchronous. Uh, <coughs> yeah, the, uh, the question for everyone. He was asking. Uh, when you're running it asynchronously, how do you determine the order in which op operations get executed? And uh, we have different schedules that you can plug in, but uh, one of the schedules that we're using is called uh, eager asynchronous. It means as soon as a vertex has updated its state, it immediately signals again to propagate the changes and the information about the changes as quickly as possible. And uh, what it usually does, it iterates over all the vertices that have to uh, collect and lets them immediately signal again. But you could plug in other scheduling techniques. You're quite free how you schedule it in an iterate through the, through the nodes, but then how do you determine the first order of iterations we know? 
Uh, sorry? You, you, you say you iterate through nodes. Yeah. But for that, you have to establish a, a, an order of the nodes for you to iterate over that. Yes. But you initialize the square ordering of nodes. Uh, it's uh, random, or random. yeah, so it's not, or it's not determined. It might be consistent over different runs on the same graph and worker combination, but it's not. Uh, okay. So you yeah. do, have you noticed if there are important changes depending on how you order this initial? I haven't analyzed that yet, so I don't know. But it's interesting, <laughs> and you, yeah, you can plug in different storage modules that determine this order, so you could run experiments quite easily about uh, with that, you know, to see if that makes a big change. Yeah. Uh, one thing that's very interesting is we have actually signal scoring, and you could prioritize the ordering of the operations. So on a vertex, you could define a score signal function that indicates how important it is for this vertex to execute the signal function. And in asynchronous mode, you could give priority to vertices that have a higher score than for ones that have a lower score. So I think you do, could do quite a lot there. Yeah. The other question is, how do you map the shortest distance to this? Uh, SSSP, for example? Or? I don't know, any. Yeah, yeah. You yes? You can map Yes, you can, yeah. Can you briefly explain? Uh, I can see if I have a slide for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, sorry. Uh, the general idea is that uh, if you want to know the shortest path from one node to all the other ones, you initialize uh, this one node with a distance of zero, and all the other ones you give something that means either no distance or infinite distance. And uh, the signal function is then uh, yeah, the signal function is the the distance of your source vertex of a, of an edge plus the weight of the, the edge. So you can have a weight on the edge, and that would represent the distance between two vertices. And then sort of it signals this distance of the source vertex plus the weight of the length of this distance to the target vertex. Yeah. And uh, the collect function is it uh, takes the smallest number that has arrived so far. So the minimum of the old state and all the numbers that have arrived. Yeah. Yeah, here you see uh, the minimum of all the ones that arrived. So you can also look around the uh, examples directory. There's examples for quite a few algorithms. Yeah. Thank you. Yes? And I want to ask about the platform which we can use to run the system. So is this tied to JVM and Java and Scala, or can you run this on the Python or in Node.js or something? Yes, it's, it's currently tied to the JVM, yeah. <coughs> so you'd have to use some uh, Python variant on the JVM to interface with it, yeah. Sorry? Uh, yeah, we're building on top of ACA, but not every vertex is represented as an actor, but the workers are represented as actors. Yeah. Yes, we're building on top of ACA. Yeah. Uh, no, not yet. Yeah. No, we usually build uh, custom parsers for whatever data format we see. Yeah. So this is something that would certainly be useful. Yeah. Yes? What about networking cross codes for libraries? Because I think uh, when you are distributed, you are yeah. highly dependent on the latency in the network. Yeah. So you have implementation between other technologies than FCC or something. Currently, we're using whatever ACA offers. So if ACA offers uh, different protocols, we can also use those, yeah. So it's sort of abstracted away from us uh, with ACA. And I think there's different implementations for the messaging with ACA, so we'd have to uh, explore those options. Yeah. 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 <coughs> okay. I think my time's up, so yeah. Yeah, thank you very much.